This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whatever you want to build online, do it with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in just a little bit. As World War II progressed, it quickly became clear that Adolf Hitler and his Nazi minions would not have everything go their own way. Yes, the early years saw the German army crush all that came before it, but with the disastrous Russian adventure and the massive build-up in Britain that would eventually become Operation Overlord, the Nazis knew that they had a real fight on their hands. And desperation often leads to drastic measures. Chances are, you might already know about the V1 and V2 weapons that began raining down on Britain shortly after D-Day. What you may not know is that there was a third V weapon. The V3 thankfully never got to the point of being used to its full extent, but it might have come pretty close. The massive gun that would have been the largest ever constructed was designed to hurl shells 165 kilometers, that's 102 miles, at a rate of 600 per minute. This beast would have been able to repeatedly hit London from its bunkers around Calais. Allied aerial bombardment meant that the V3 in northern France never became operational, and a smaller version was instead directed against Luxembourg, with only minimal results. It was designed to be the largest gun the world had ever seen, and it very nearly was. The Virgil Tungswaffen weapons, which translates into English as reprisal or retribution weapons, ominous, I know, but this was the Nazis after all, began hitting mainland Britain in 1944. The V-1, a rudimentary flying bomb, first landed on the English capital early in the morning of the 13th of June 1944. The British soon became quite adept at bringing them down, but they still caused 6,184 civilian deaths in London. The V-2 was a more advanced and successful weapon. These rockets, which can be seen as an early precursor to our modern intercontinental ballistic missiles, were first launched against London from The Hague in Holland on the 8th of September 1944. Efforts to bring down the V-2s proved much harder than the V-1s, while Allied air attacks against the launch sites were also largely ineffective. The V-2 attacks on Britain continued until the end of March 1944, before being turned on Belgium as the Allied invasion force pushed forward. Interestingly, V-2 rockets were even deployed against German targets after Hitler ordered them used to destroy bridgeheads across the Rhine on the 17th of March 1945. The V-2 caused more damage than the V-1, but in total inflicted fewer deaths, with 2,754 killed in London as a result of the attacks. But the combined damage of the two weapons was horrific, with an estimated 20,000 houses damaged each day at the height of the bombing campaign. But it's long been said that these V weapons were more psychological than physical. While their damage can't be discounted, it was significantly less than what occurred during the Blitz. Things would have been quite different, however, if the third V weapon had ever been fully utilized. Our knowledge and understanding of this weapon are unfortunately quite vague, because they were either destroyed or withdrawn during the war. We are left with some intriguing black and white photos, patches of information, and, well, plenty of questions. But let's begin with what we know, or rather what we think we know. The V3 was quite unlike any gun before or after it, in that it used multiple propellant charges to generate its massive firepower. These charges were placed along the barrel and were designed to go off at the very moment the projectile passed. If that sounds horribly complicated, well, it really is, and it was one of the biggest obstacles to the V3's success. The gun used solid rocket fuel boosters instead of traditional explosives because they were easier to use and better suited to the gun's unique requirements. These boosters were placed in symmetrical pairs, 32 in total we believe, along the barrel that was reported to be a huge 130 meters, that's 430 feet long. They were angled in such a way that their thrust would hit the base of the shell as it passed by them. The gun was designed to use 150mm caliber shells, each weighing 140 kilograms, and as I said earlier in the video, it was hoped that the gun could fire at a rate of 600 shells per minute with a muzzle velocity of 1,500 meters per second. <laughs> 
The idea behind a super weapon of this magnitude was certainly not new. The Germans had famously used the Paris gun to shell the French capital from a distance of 120 kilometers during the First World War, but this was a step further. By the way, we've covered the Paris gun along with the V1 already on Mega Projects, so if you're into German super weapons, then, well, look no further than right here. The V3's design had been around since the mid 19th century, originating in the United States. Prototypes were built and tested in 1860 and 1880 but neither proved successful, mainly because the explosive charges fired too early and the team behind it eventually abandoned the idea. Shortly before the end of World War I, the French began designing their own version of the weapon, almost certainly in response to the Paris gun. But with the conclusion of the war, those plans were indefinitely shelved. Fast forward 22 years, and with French resistance crumbling, the Germans pushed past what had been the front lines of the Great War and quickly took control of the country. Now, whoever had been responsible for those plans for the French gun from the First World War apparently didn't do a great job at concealing them, as they quickly fell into German hands. The plans attracted the attention of August Condes, a German engineer who had developed the bunker-busting Rochling shell. His initial blueprints called for the charges to be electrically activated rather than using explosives and presented the grand plan of 50 such guns launching 3,000 rounds a day at London. And I'm sure you don't need me to tell you of the kind of damage that that could inflict on a city. Tests on a small prototype 20mm multi-chamber gun were encouraging, and the idea found its way to Albert Speer, Minister of Armaments and War Production, who in turn pitched the idea to Adolf Hitler. And as you can imagine, Adolf Hitler loved the idea of raining shells down on London from Calais. By the end of 1943, a full-caliber prototype had been built in Germany, but it came with a catalog of problems. The gun repeatedly failed to generate the kind of muzzle velocity that had been proposed, and even designing the projectiles was proving to be an absolute nightmare. A full-scale 150-meter barrel was constructed on the island of Wurlin in the Baltic Sea in early 1944, as the Germans prepared to put the first V3 through rigorous large-scale testing. Now we'll continue with the story of the V3 in just a moment, but first, a word from our amazing sponsor, Squares. Space. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're reaching deep into the savings account to start that new crafts business, or maybe they're launching a blog to share their opinions with friends and neighbors. The world really is yours, and Squarespace is the perfect web tool to help you fashion it into whatever you like. It's the platform to use when you're ready to get started on that web project that you've been thinking about. If you're looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like, well, Squarespace is ideal for that. Just use one of their quick and beautiful templates to make a website that looks like it's designed for you but super easy to do. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person, you've got lots of opinions and ideas about how exactly you want your site to look. Well, Squarespace gives you all the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. And once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe just playing with the colors, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so that your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, everything you need in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, just go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash megaprojects to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to the video. The German testing of the V3 was hampered because of the slow process of designing a new projectile for the superweapon. Six designs were initially deemed satisfactory, with these eventually whittled down to four by the end of May 1944. The major problem with the projectiles had been obturation, which is essentially barrel blockage. This appears to have been solved by placing a sealing piston between the projectile and the initial propellant charge. This stopped the flash from the charge jumping ahead of the shell and enabled the steady control of all the charges, which enabled the projectile to successfully exit the barrel, sort of important when you are making a very large gun. Testing on Wallen took place between the 20th and the 24th of May 1944, with the gun reaching distances of up to 88 kilometers, that's 55 miles. On the 4th of July 1944, a major test got underway with the gun firing eight shots in quick succession. One of the shells traveled 93 kilometers, but the gun itself grumbled under the pressure and burst after firing the eighth round. Other barrels existed, so this wasn't a complete disaster, but it was a major setback nonetheless. This is also the last piece of information we have on full-scale testing. Thank <laughs> you. 
Throne's development and testing, the Germans had been searching for and then preparing the perfect launch site to attack London. The site they chose was Mimiak, an area 18 kilometers, that's 11 miles southwest of Calais, and 8 kilometers from the coast, meaning it would be out of range of Royal Navy guns lurking in the English Channel. Codenames Weiser, Meadow, and Balvo Harbin 711, Construction Project 711, work began in Mimiak to build the V3 launch site in September 1943. It was built using prisoners of war from the nearby concentration camps alongside the organization TART, which was the civil and military engineering organization in Nazi Germany. The Mimiak site was composed of two parallel facilities, roughly a thousand meters apart. Each came with five weapon chambers, each 105 meters long and angled at 50 degrees. Each of these chambers was designed to hold five V3s clustered together. The chambers exited the hillside through enormous concrete slabs, 30 meters wide and 5.5 meters thick, designed to protect the muzzles below. Roughly 20 meters below ground lies a complex network of tunnels and underground ammunition storage galleries, as well as support facilities for the estimated 1,000 soldiers from the Artillery Abteilung 705 unit that would have manned the guns. What we see today isn't quite as extensive as had been planned, because after a series of failures during testing, it was decided to scale back the operation to three chambers in each section instead of five, even though work had already begun on the other chambers. The Mimoyak site suffered heavy bombing almost as soon as the Allies realized that something was being constructed. The V1 and V2s were already hitting Britain, and most likely the Allies believed this to be a launch site of the earlier V weapons. As far as we know, the Allied forces didn't know about the existence of the V3 until after the war. But they certainly poured plenty of explosives down on the area. Between November 1943 and August 1944, Allied aircraft dropped 4,102 tons of bombs on Mimuek. While the nearby village was all but obliterated, the depth and enormous amount of concrete used meant that much of the site remained intact, and only 11 people died during the bombing raids, a quite unbelievable fact considering the amount of firepower and the amount of people working at the site. One of the most daring planned raids on Mimwek came under Operation Aphrodite, which included what can only be described as rudimentary forms of drones. Two separate attacks were launched against Mimwek, the second of which included a young Joseph Kennedy Jr., older brother to the future US President John F. Kennedy. Operation Aphrodite turned out to be almost completely ineffective, but it does paint a fascinating picture as to the extent the Allies were willing to go to to attack these launch sites in northern France. The plan was simple, yet complex enough to never work properly. The idea was was to take B-17 and B-24 bombers that were no longer fit for regular duty and load them with explosives. The aircraft would then take off as normal, but when it reached an altitude of 600 meters, the crew would bail out, leaving the aircraft under the control of another aircraft nearby using the Azon system, a radio control system originally designed to guide bombs to their targets. The bombers also had two television cameras fitted in the cockpit with a view of both the grounds and the gauges in the aircraft, which was then beamed back to the mothership as it was referred to. In theory, the mothership could take control of the giant flying bomb these aircrafts had become and guide them towards their targets, where they would dive nose first and obliterate everything on the ground and hopefully beneath it also. It was hoped these kinds of attacks could destroy the formidable underground bunkers that the Nazis had built across northern France. However, the operation was nothing short of disastrous. Of the 14 missions flown under Operation Aphrodite between August 1944 and October 1944, not a single plane managed to hit its intended target. On the 12th of August, 1944, Lieutenant Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. and Lieutenant Wilford J. Willey climbed into their B-24 Liberator, stuffed with 9,071 kilograms of explosives. The bomber hurtled along the runway at RAF Woodbridge before lifting slowly into the sky. The target that day was the still mysterious Mimuyak site, although unbeknownst to the Allies, this site had already been effectively abandoned after a series of heavy bombing raids. Sadly, still some way off their bailout points, the explosives on board the B-24 detonated unexpectedly, killing the two-man crew instantly. It's not known exactly when the Mimwek site was finally put out of action, but we believe it was sometime in July 1944. The complex had of course never been finished, let alone come anywhere close to firing a V3. Hitler's ambition of hitting London with his third revenge weapon now seemed highly unlikely, but he soon set his sights on a new target. The V-3 project was eventually passed to the SS, who commissioned the construction of two shorter V-3 guns, approximately 50 meters long, with 12 side chambers. 
The guns were placed in a wooded area near Lamparden, about 13 kilometers southeast of Cher in Germany. The barrels pointed at the city of Luxembourg, which had already been liberated roughly 43 kilometers away. This was at a time when Hitler was preparing his final roll of the dice, the massive Ardennes counteroffensive, also known as the Battle of the Bulge, which he hoped would swing the tide of war back in his favor. On the 30th of December 1944, the V3s began firing for the first time. The projectiles had been adapted and were now 95 kilogram shells carrying 7 to 9 kilograms of explosive charges, while the gun itself had a muzzle velocity of around 935 meters per second. The second gun went into operation on the 11th of January 1945, and until the 22nd of February 1945, a total of 183 rounds were fired at Luxembourg, killing 10 and wounding 35. As German defensive positions began crumbling along the Western Front, the V3s were withdrawn. It seems as if there was plenty of discussion about relocating them to other areas, but nothing concrete ever came of it, not least because the German railway system now lay in absolute tatters. The small version of the V3 fired its final round on the 22nd of January 1945, with US troops now only three kilometers away. There is still so much we don't know about the V3. We're still not sure whether the Germans felt confident enough after testing it to install them at Mimue. The complexities of the underground site seem to suggest a confidence that the V3 would eventually come through. However, considering the number of issues it experienced during testing, it's unclear how effective the large-scale V3 would have actually been. This was a weapon that was rushed from the very start. In reality, it probably needed years more development and testing before taking its place in northern France. But with the war swinging in the Allies' favor, the Germans became increasingly desperate to gain an advantage. We may never know just how close the V3 came to being fully operational, and it remains the greatest and largest gun that ever was. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, please do leave it in the comments because that is where I look for uh, making a lot of these new videos. So please do that, and also please do support our fantastic sponsor Squarespace. There's a link below, and thank you for watching.